everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out to either our 9.30 or 11.30 service on Sunday. But if you can't, you can always watch us online here at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can look up any past messages, see any of our upcoming events, and read pastor's blogs. Also, be sure to follow us on social media right here. And now, here's this week's message. I really believe God wants us to understand something of how we are to be the conduit that becomes the expression of God's kingdom to the world around us. You and I are actually the gates through which the kingdom of heaven enters the earth, according to Scripture. Lift up your heads, O you gates, that the kingdom of God uh, that the king of glory would come in, that Jesus would enter into circumstances and situations. This really is the essence of legacy and what we're trying to accomplish and understand and allow God to awaken. It's really interesting. Just uh, this week and over the course of the weekend, I have just felt the Lord just compelling me to expect more than what I would commonly expect, even on a Sunday when I typically come expecting. And I want to invite you, will you today expect more than what maybe you commonly expect into uncommon expectations for God to awaken something by His Spirit within our hearts, our faith being ignited to another dimension, to believe that we are the gates through which heaven will come in and begin to truly transform the world around us. Will you believe with me for that today, for an impartation from the heart of God? Come on, let's just receive that together as a family. Father, we invite you to have your way to speak according to your plan, not according to our agenda, but your motives and your plans, Lord, would prevail in everything that we focus in on. Lord, I pray that we would truly recognize that we have had a conversation with the Lord our God by the time we walk out of this place through the course of greeting and connecting and when we walked in, worship, experience in that regard, a declaration of your word, Lord, awakening things within us, taking us to deeper places of understanding what it really is to walk with God and to serve God to express your kingdom in the earth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Just believing, an attitude of faith. We're just stirring up an atmosphere. Come on, this is an atmosphere that does grow giant killers in the kingdom of God. We recognize we're under a mandate to accomplish some things um, that are beyond what maybe our understanding is, even in the season that we're in now. I really feel the Lord's taking us into an accelerated place of expression, a next season, another place of influence. And so uh, we're focusing in on this word legacy, and I've said you'll never leave a legacy until you first choose to live a legacy. So my question to you today and what we're going to talk about is, are you living a legacy. On a scale of 1 to 10, I want you to think, are you living a legacy? That's a sacrificial life where you're living a legacy. And if you are living a legacy, then you will be leaving a legacy. And we've looked at this. This is a very important concept, and I really introduced it specifically last week. But I want to bring it into uh, just focus today as we get started again. There were two men who lived roughly the same era of time and there's been a, a study done on more than 1,000 of their descendants. And you'll see a chart that'll pop up that shows Jonathan Edwards on the left, Max Jukes on the right. Jonathan Edwards became a Christian, served the Lord, became a mighty revivalist, honored God. And all of the, the descendants that we read that came from him, pre college presidents, college professors, military officers, public servants, authors, doctors, judges, pastors, lawyers, senators, and a vice president from a man that just wanted to serve the Lord and introduce a sacrificial lifestyle. It impacted his children and his children's children. And then Max Jukes on the right, basically we see just a horrible expression and no telling what it costs society for Max Jukes to live his life in a self-absorbed perspective producing 310 people who died on the streets, 150 criminals, seven murderers, over 100 drunks, and 190 prostitutes. It's a really interesting parallel. I was kind of reflecting on this uh, this week as, 
as we, um, we looked at, and it was actually an Easter Sunday, we had Billy Graham, um, the late Billy Graham, uh, we played a prayer uh, that he led people to Christ. And on that particular Easter, it's been a few years ago now, he, his prayer was the salvation prayer that we prayed on that day. And we com- contrasted his life and we looked at his picture. Do you remember? And right next to him, I put Hugh Hefner, the late Hugh Hefner, who was uh, basically a kingpin in the porn industry. And, and I just asked the question, and, and we really need to evaluate, what is the legacy that will remain after we're gone. What is the legacy of your life? What legacy are you living? Because that's the legacy that you are leaving. We have to be very careful. I want to kind of break this down first on a parental element. And what I'm about to say, if you have kids that are, you know, five or younger, then you're going to really like this and you're going to think, oh, wow, I can do that with my kids. Uh, If you have kids that are older than that, then you might find yourself thinking things like this. Oh, man, I wish I'd have known that when when we were younger. I want you to think about it in the context of your life, whether you're a parent or not a parent, a parent that you feel like, I wish I'd have known that earlier. How many of you know if you'll pick up skills along the way, then you can apply those skills not just in your own life, but in the lives of those that might be spiritual sons and daughters that God brings into your life, or one day as a grandparent. Can you imagine what I'm going to be like as a grandfather? It is crazy to think about that. But we parents have to be careful not to give our kids everything except that which made us capable of giving them something. We have to be very careful not to give them everything except that which made us capable of giving them something. And it's too easy to give them stuff and not really give them the important stuff. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so the first blank on your card, the strength of your life comes from the struggles that you face. How many of you believe that's true? You've walked through struggles in your life, and when you walk through those struggles, it begins to redeem and produce a great strength as a result of the struggle when handled correctly. If you remain in the struggle and you do not Uh, advance past that struggle, then you're just going to keep repeating the same grade in the kingdom of God until you finally pass that test and then you move to the next level. Struggles are not to hold you back. Struggles are actually to strengthen you so that you can move ahead. There are some parts of your assignment, listen loud and clear, there are some parts of your assignment God can never entrust to your care because you did not handle the struggle constructively. Therefore, if he gave you the next level of the assignment, the next level of the assignment could potentially crush your life because you don't have the strength required from having responded to the struggle that you need to walk into that next dimension of the call of God on your life. I want you to hear what I'm saying so importantly about your legacy, and not just you, but it's the generations after you that need the strength that you redeem by walking through the struggles of your life. And then we need to train up our children in understanding the constructive nature of the struggle. The strength of your life comes from the struggles you face. If you give somebody the stuff it takes to bail them out of their situation without empowering them with strength that comes from the struggle to get free, then you're really not doing them a long-term favor. Are we all on the same page? And so let me break this down in a way that we've done this with our, with our daughters. This is one thing we did when they were very young. We said, we want you to know that when you turn 16, if you want a car the day you turn 16, you can have any car you want. How many of you are thinking, you are, uh, if you're a teenager and you're thinking, will you adopt me? Uh, How many of you know it always comes with the trick, right? (laughs) Sounds great. You can have any car you want, but here's the deal. You're going to work. As a little child, we're explaining this. You're going to work and you're going to make money and you're going to come up with creative ways to build up your savings account because when you decide you're ready to buy a car, you can have any car you want. And we'll pay half of whatever that price is. If you want a $40,000 car, you're going to have to save $20,000. If you want a $4,000 car, you're going to have to save $2,000. You know what we were doing? We were introducing them to a struggle that caused them then to get the idea of what they needed to do to accomplish something in their life. 
The struggle produced a strength, and they, interestingly enough, uh, part of our deal was they had to, to look at and understand consumer reports, and if you're going to buy a car, what is a car normally, you know, what happens in terms of problems that the car is going to have, and we're just trying to educate our kids to understand there's a certain struggle with what you're doing. You don't just show up in my house and get a brand new car with a bow on it and not have to get through any struggle to have any strength to understand why you're driving what you're driving. You understand, it's important that we get this concept. Everybody has their own way of walking this out. But don't just give your kids the stuff. Give your kids the struggle so that they'll have the strength to sustain the stuff that they have in their life. So here we are now at another stage of life, and both of our daughters are in college. And they're living at home. And they're in college. And they're living at home. They're adults. And they're living at home. And they're paying rent. If you're going to be an adult and you're going to live in my house, then you're going to understand adult responsibilities. How many hours do you need to work a week in order to, no. (laughs) I can tell the kids are going to hate me after today. Every teenager in the church, let's find a different church. That man's crazy. No, let me explain the whole scenario. Everybody's going to take a different approach. I'm just telling you what we do to give you some practical ideas. If you're going to become an adult and you're going to live at home, I understand you're going to college and we want to offer you help and assistance and all those things, but if you're going to live in our house, you're going to pay rent. You know what we've done? We've said what you're going to do is pay rent. We've decided what they're going to pay monthly, and I don't want their money. I want them to be wise with their money. I simply want to instill them with a strength that will come from a struggle of having to think, all right, if I'm going to have to have gas for my car, if I want to go out and eat with my friends, don't be taking my credit card. You're going to get a job. You're going to have gas, going to have out food with my friends and pay my rent. How many hours a week am I going to have to work to make this happen over the course of a month? And they've had to calculate all this. They know how many hours they've got to work at their job to make all this work. They're taking their monthly rent and they are putting it in a savings account Per our agreement, that is their savings account that will one day day be a part of the deposit or the down payment that they will make to buy a house. So that's just our approach to this thing. Whatever your approach is, all I'm saying is you better figure out some way to give your kids a struggle that will produce a strength so that they're not getting the stuff that will destroy their life because they don't have the strength to sustain the stuff because you never gave them the struggle. And that's what you had to go through to give them what you gave them. Come on, today we're declaring this in Jesus' mighty name. No good parent, write it in, no good parent gives the child the valuables without first giving them the values. I don't want my kids to have my valuables if they cannot carry the values that I use, that we use and exercise to get the valuables in our lives. How many of you know, we just sang it. He's a good, good, hmm. Let's go back and celebrate, parents. I know you were with me a minute ago when we were talking about your kids. I'm about to talk to you about God's kids. See, I'm talking to you about your kids, and we're all happy. Yeah, they're going to pay rent now, baby. You! I know! They're going to have some values. You heard the pastor. You got some values. You're going to get my values. You're going to get my values. You're going to get my values. He's a good, good father. Are you asking God to give you his valuables without practicing his values in the kingdom of God? Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23. The purpose of tithing. Mm, mm, mm. I knew you were going to go there. (laughs) The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. Tithing 
has the purpose of teaching you to put God first in your lives. Or it becomes the physical demonstration that the values of God belong to me. And if the values of God become my practice, then the valuables of God become a possession that become entrusted to my care to expand the kingdom of God in the earth. I know this is hard. I know it is a struggle to tithe. I know it is a struggle to give. I know it is a struggle. Maybe God has set you up for the struggle to produce the strength so you can demonstrate you're ready for the next level of what he wants to entrust to your care. Because every time you increase, it's a struggle to take that step and trust God again. And what happens after you keep positioning yourself in the struggle? I just decided uh, about five, six years ago, I'm not going to grow old and weak as I start getting a little older in years. I'm at least 40 now. And as I start growing, why is that so funny? And I, I start growing a little older in years, I have decided that I'm going to do a certain routine of, of, of exercise. I really didn't know what this would do, but I started doing three days a week. I do a pretty intense regiment of push-ups. And now, over the course of years of doing push-ups, I can do a lot of push-ups from a very deep expression of the muscle in my arms and chest that it takes to do those particular push-ups. And so, how many of you like for me to demonstrate 500 push-ups for you right now? I bet you would. But over the course of time, when I purpose that I'm going to keep on struggling and keep on struggling and keep on struggling, on purpose, keep on struggling, then I just have developed this incredible strength from the result of a continual perpetual struggle. Maybe God's trying to position you in a place of financial strength through your financial struggle where you've proven yourself to embrace the values of God so the valuables of God can be entrusted to our care and see the kingdom of God expand in the earth. I believe that God is bringing about in the year 2020 a very unique expression of church. You know, A.T. has led a couple of churches himself. We've had a lot of conversation about this. I began to share with him a, an idea that, that we've used over the course of years in working with other organizations and a consultant model called the 3D 10-stage model and it's just this concept of how to awaken the dream that exists within the heart of a leader of an organization or a church. How many of you know the problem with most organizations is they're trying to duplicate somebody else's success? And, and when you hear that, you think, well, what's the problem? Like, it's America. That's what we do. We find the corporate structure that works, and we duplicate that, right? Uh, well, that is what you do culturally. But let me tell you what you do biblically. You don't try to duplicate somebody else's success. You learn to multiply your own identity. And if you don't know who you are, then you're trying to be somebody else, and you never will get it right. You'll constantly feel out of sync. And I'm going to launch into this particular class in our next Leadership Institute. I'm asking all of our staff and elders if they will purpose to be there for this particular launch. We're going to focus in on Sunday night where we're going to talk about how do you know who you are and what dream exists within your heart. We've now had a church contact us and say, can we get a congregational rate? We want to bring our congregation into this six-week class on Sunday night. I'm not sure how we're going to manage all of it, but we do know we're going to have to move out of the room upstairs, and we're going to come down in here on Sunday night for those particular six weeks that will be starting in about a month or so. We'll be giving you some more information about all of that. But the bottom line, what I'm trying to say to you is, I believe there are books that exist within your heart. I believe there are businesses that exist within your heart. I I believe there are organizations that will impact and transform society that exists within your heart. And I say to you, unlock something in your personal life so God's hand will be on everything you're about to do. This is important. Second Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that though he was rich, yet for your sake... He became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Such an amazing verse of Scripture. How many of you are you're just so blessed? <laughs> I mean, we are just so blessed. 
and we're blessed because of what he did to help us be blessed. And then he asks us to follow the suit that he set, follow the example that he set, so that we would not just get blessed and spend it all on our own self-absorbed lives. I want to have fun. I want to enjoy this. I want to enjoy that. Oh, I want to enjoy that. I want to build up that. I want to. What does Jesus want to do with the increase that he's bringing into our lives? I believe that he wants to transform society and introduce 20 points of transformational impact that is going to be awakened out of this house in the year 2020. I believe we're going to leave the world a better place in a powerful, profound, and amazing way. Come on, help me please, just for about 60 seconds. We're believing God together. We're declaring in an attitude of faith. God is stirring something up in our hearts. God is awakening something within our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 7 says, Remember, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I've had people ask me, Pastor, why did we go away from passing offering plates? Why don't we send the plates down? I had some people fussy with me when we went away from the offering buckets. I mean, you know, not everybody likes change. But change is inevitable if we're going to continue to grow. And there was a point in time where I felt this was just a conviction God was placing in my heart. This is why. I want to I say to you guys, let your, I, I, I know I can take what I'm saying. Believe me, I know I can take what I'm saying, and I can really use it to twist and wind you up and make you feel guilty and obligated and require something from you, and take something from you today as a result of using and perverting the truth God wants us to so value and appreciate. And I just say to you, I will never do that to you. I'll stand before God for the way I handle the truth that he entrusts to my care and to our care. And I know that's the case. And an elder started that hand clap just now. Because our elders watch and pray. Our elders ask me questions when they need to ask me questions. And I'm an open book, and we're a transparent place, and we have nothing to hide, and we're constantly wanting God to bless everything he's called us to do. And I want to say to you, give as an expression of worship. God's always had this in, involved in the expansion of the kingdom. We looked at it last week, Melchizedek and Abram brought a tithe to Melchizedek. 450 years before the law. This is not an Old Testament law issue. This is a kingdom principle. God wants us to understand out of the generous nature of embracing the generous nature of God, we become expressive. And we do that by way of honoring the Lord with the first fruits, with the masra, with the tenth, first tenth of the increase of our life. Just learning to be generous sacrificially before the Lord as a lifestyle unlocks something in the way that you will live your life in your everyday basis. It's an amazing reality, an amazing principle. But I want to say to you, let your giving be worship to God. And understand this very important thing, especially as we're talking about launching 20 points of transformational expression this next year. I, I want you to hear this. Give, Luke 6, 38, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Men will give into your lap. I, I want you to hear what the scripture is saying here. Give to God, and men will give to you. It's, it's, a, it's a bizarre thing, isn't it? Give to God, and men will give. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. See, anything you give always comes back. How many of you know it is very difficult not to smile at somebody who is smiling at you? If you want to smile, give a smile. And even if that person doesn't normally smile, it is very difficult for them not to give a smile back. 
Why? Because when you give, God says it will be given back to you with the same measure you use. Give a great big cheesy smile, like real big smile, and you'll get the weirdest smile back. <laughs> like they won't even know how to smile. They'll just be trying to reciprocate in some measure or capacity. If you want attention, give attention. If you want friendship, give friendship. If you want love, give love. So I can hear the tension in the room. I can hear the argument that exists within the hearts of individuals when I'm saying this. And they start to formulate the argument and they say things like this. Pastor, you have no idea how much I gave myself to the relationship. You have no idea how much I gave myself to that man. You have no idea how much I gave myself to that woman. And they never gave anything back. That's the argument. But you have to understand that argument needs to be met with truth. And the truth is simply this. You have to understand what you give doesn't always come back from the source which you gave it to. It comes back from the source who is God. And it might come from another angle. But how many of you know the Bible says it, so it's true. And that settles it, and we declare it, and we agree for it, and we walk this thing out. It's, it's funny because it'll not only come back to you, it'll not only come back to your life. It'll come back to your legacy. I, I don't know if you understand, but I mention her name every once in a while. Bertha Swilling. This is my great-grandmother. And though our family weren't you know, like a whole bunch of Christians. My great-grandmother was. And my great-grandmother made sure that my mom got to, uh, what's it called? Vacation Bible School. And that's where my mom came to know Jesus as a child, even though her parents didn't take her to school. And my great-grandmother, Bertha Swilling, gave. And she was generous. She didn't have much, but she gave. And do you understand that I'm living my life in the wake of her blessing because she gave, it came back to her life and her legacy, and it's going to continue and perpetuate beyond. This is a really important principle that you understand because in your life, once you've figured this principle out, people can't figure out why they like you. People can't figure out why they're attracted to you. People can't figure out why they hire you. People can't figure out why they promote you. People can't figure out why they want to give you a raise. They just can't figure it out. Why? Because you positioned yourself for God to bless you with favor, and suddenly the opportunities and the options begin to expand as a result of your surrendered available life. I came here 30 years ago to interview with Jim and Diane Howard, and they were looking for somebody who would ultimately become the principal of the school. And I was too young to become the principal of the school. I was too inexperienced to become the principal of the school. I was a little too crazy to become the principal of the school. And I came in and interviewed after they'd interviewed another man who apparently had his PhD. I didn't meet the man. I just had them tell me about it a little bit later. And so they, they were going to either hire somebody with a PhD, with a doctorate, that could come in and ultimately become the principal of the school, or they could hire a knucklehead that was young and inexperienced and had no reason for them to hire. But for some reason in that meeting, they just couldn't shake it. They just couldn't get it get it off, that there's something, something happened in our interaction, something happened in our conversation, and God was in this moment where I'm celebrating your faithfulness, and I want to say thank you for taking a risk, because God was in this moment as he was releasing something more than what they could see in that moment. Come on, the favor of God is being released upon your life even now. Ah! There's more. There is more. When we begin to do what God is asking us to do, we must be supernaturally helped by God to do it. This is pride will cause you to withhold your generosity from God. It is self-sufficiency. I, I, I don't, don't trust you quite enough, God. I'm taking it until I'm ready. And then when I'm in a better place, then 
I'll address the pride that kept me from trusting in you. I mean, it is what it is. And what's happening, God is intersecting our lives and bringing us together. Our gifted lives are being brought together on purpose. I mean, you know it's true. And I just want to celebrate amazing transformation. You know, Tracy mentioned the wedding that we hosted in our backyard yesterday. Two people with crazy backgrounds. Like they shouldn't have ever, you know, it shouldn't have ever been like in the Christian circle. <laughs> crazy backgrounds. Both of them came to know Jesus. Both of them grew and developed roots. Both of them met right here in this house. And we've celebrated Tiff and Evan and, and what God's doing. And here they are on their honeymoon now. I'm just going to tell you something. It, it, I, as I was standing in my backyard doing this wedding, and she said, they read their vows to each other, and she said something along this line, never in my life have I had a man who loved me intellectually and wanted to have conversation with me and touch my heart without trying to touch my body. Thank you. They kept themselves in their relationship until their wedding night. Come on, there are things we need to understand God is trying to bring about in this place for redemption and transformation in powerful and wonderful ways. And this caught my attention because I, I noticed online somebody who attends our church posted this, this uh, Instagram post, and, and I, I have this progression of these four pictures that I want to show you. And this is, her name is Wendy Dunaway. And Wendy posted this, this post online about how she faced one of her fears. And she said, I faced a fear tonight and spoke shortly in front of a small group of people. I was an absolute mess, and I forgot half of what I wanted to say, but it's a start. And I, you see the, the first post down there, Dave, that's Wendy's husband, Dave. And he said, you did an awesome job, my love. It was so sweet. Here's what happened. Here's the picture. I happened to be in the room when this took place. And this was going on uh, in, was it in, oh no, it was in a Discover Destiny community group. And I want to say thank you to the six of you that are uh, leading the group and, and making that all happen. But, but here's Wendy giving her logo and explaining a little bit of her life. And that's Dave on her left. And I, and I, I looked at, I happened to capture that. So I posted it online to that. And then I thought about, you know, just it was a few months back, like in June, this was taking place as they had decided it is time to go all in for Jesus. And here's Dave, and he and I have a similar haircut in that picture, it looks like. And, and there we are, like ready to celebrate what Jesus was doing. And after Dave was baptized, he hopped out of there. And there's Wendy. Come on. I believe God brings transformation into people's lives. This is what Dave said. I grew up in church but drifted far away from God. I began partying, doing drugs. I met Wendy and decided to give up that old lifestyle. My lifestyle caught up with me, and the doctor told me I had stage 4 liver damage. We started attending Destiny, believing God for the best. Here we are today, standing in a strong Bible, faith-based church with an awesome church family. God has healed me, making my blood counts normal. No hepatitis C. There is no liver cancer. To God be the glory. I think we ought to celebrate. Come on. He's a God who heals and redeems and restores. Wendy told me, the very first time Dave and I attended Destiny, we felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I have never felt more welcome and love from people of all backgrounds. We began watching online, and then we decided we needed to actually be there. So Easter, we came home to the most loving, non-judgmental, real, open, and transparent people I have ever encountered in a church. Since we've been going to Destiny, I've seen my two oldest come back to Jesus, my youngest learning to love God, and even some other family members are coming back to their faith. Thank you, Destiny family, for helping me see the heart of Jesus. Come on, I want to ask if you'll stand. Right here they are, man. I just want to say thank you for your transparency. Come on. Praise God. <laughs> and Father, we just bless Dave and Wendy right now. We pronounce in Jesus' mighty name that you have not only strengthened them through this previous season, but you have strengthened them for a time such as this. We pray, Lord, continue deposits in their lives in powerful and profound ways as a couple and each of them individually as they continue to grow in their relationship with Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, church family. We've got a lot to celebrate. We have a lot to be thankful for.
So what happens, we bring our gifted lives together and we become an expression that produces an atmosphere of God's kingdom in the room, in the lobby, in the kids area, in the coffee area, at the front door. We, our lives are intersected together. Our gifted lives come together to express God's kingdom on the campus for the purposes of awakening that expression everywhere we go. We're going to understand that more and more in this coming year. I'm convinced of it. But I want us just to pause for about three minutes and just celebrate what we see God has done from so many people working in the previous 40 days or so. We call it the 30-plus days of destiny. Uh, But just so many people working so hard to provide an atmosphere like this that grows giant killers like Dave and Wendy. I think when we came into the church, it was the presence of the Holy Spirit in here, and then, and then people kind of built it all up into one ball of love. I just felt reconnected to the vision that God gave me whenever I came here. thank you church family because all that stuff happens because we put all of our energy together on a regular perpetuating basis some people show up and and help from time to time but it's the faithful consistent find my place serve God faithfully that releases something so stable and strengthening in the earth and that's who we are as a church family so I want to ask you if you'll stand with me I want us today to receive communion together as a family So we've provided some extra elements of communion. Um, There'll be two stations up here and the three stations in the back. And I'm going to ask you in just a moment to make your way to those. But I want to invite you to, to answer this question in your own heart. It's a very important question before we do anything else. Have you decided that you are serving Jesus for the rest of your life? Have you come to the conclusion and the decision that we're celebrating that has produced so much transformation? Because, like, we're not just about transformation. Like, you can have a better life. God wants you to know. We want you to understand the way to do this is to meet Jesus Christ for real. Like, for real. 
not just apply religious principles, but meet him and know him personally. And then he walks with you through your everyday life by the power of his spirit. You know Abba Father. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Jesus died so that we could live. He became sin so that we could become righteous. He became sickness so that we could become healed. So I just want to invite you, wherever you are in your relationship with the Lord, I want to invite everybody to take a step forward in that. But first and foremost, come on, just posture your heart before him. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to each of us to understand with clarity what our personal relationship with you is really all about. And out of that, everything else flows. In the name of Jesus, if you're here and you say, you know, I'm not sure I'm even serving God. I'm not sure I'm a Christian and I want to make sure of that. And I want you just to lift up your hand and say, today I surrender my life to Jesus Christ 100% everything that I am. Thank you. Anybody else? Just quickly. Everything that I am. Thank you. Anybody else? You can put your hands down. Come on, in this place of surrender, Lord, we thank you that you make yourself available to us, that we can have, have access into God's presence in a profound and powerful way. We thank you that you are the Savior of the world, and we desperately need you, not only as our Savior today, but the Lord of our lives for the rest of our lives. We acknowledge that you came to redeem us from our sin, cause us to become the very righteousness of God, through your broken body, through your shed blood, we have access to the amazing presence of God with utter confidence in the name of Jesus. Come on, if that's your prayer, I want you just to say real loud, amen and amen and amen. 